Good morning. I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates, and thanks for watching. And I'm going to ask you to share and like this. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to share and like this uh, uh, content if uh, if it's something you think you would like to see more of in the mornings, maybe 9 a.m. I was wondering whether people would want to see a, a, um, a live wrap of the uh, day's headlines every morning at 9 a.m., and I figured the best way to see whether people would be interested in that was to try it. And so if you see this and like it, please share it, and uh, the numbers will drive the decision, and if so, we'll, we'll do it a lot more. Uh, before I dive into today's headlines, I want to share with you a headline that uh, we broke on Friday. Uh, TYT investigative reporter Tiwa Chang and I collaborated on a story about um, how Texas politicians and regulators took money from the very industry that those regulators are supposed to oversee, energy industry, and then proceeded to deregulate it, leading, of course, to last week's disa uh, power disasters. So I hope you go over to tyt.com slash investigates. That's tyt.com slash investigates. The top story is that collaboration between Tiwa Chang and myself, and you can see the rest of our, our original reporting as well. Uh, that said, let's dive into some of the uh, headlines from other folks that are making news today. The big story that everyone's talking about today is the uh, COVID bill, the House COVID bill. This is the $1.9 trillion relief bill is heading to the House Budget Committee. Now they're gonna mark it up. They're not gonna change it too much. They can't add amendments, things like that, but they're gonna do the, the little tweaks and things that, that uh, Congress does to a bill along the way. By the end of the week, Friday, Saturday, they're hoping, they're hoping to get uh, a vote on the House floor on the full bill and send it on to the Senate where they're hoping, hoping to get a, a full vote next week or at least send it to the Senate and start Senate action next week. The reason this matters, one reason the urgency matters is that on March 14th, the unemployment extension runs out, which means a lot of aid that is currently going to people who have lost their jobs is going to run out. And so with nothing to fill that gap, you're going to see people start getting further and further into economic deprivation. So. Uh, Right now, the, the big question, House passage is not really a question. It's expected, the, the relief package is expected to pass the House with no Republican votes, but enough Democratic votes to pass. The question is, what are the GOP hangups that are potentially going to cause a problem in the Senate? And we know that Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia, has already balked at the, the bill's provision for raising the minimum wage over years to... $15 an hour, $15 an hour. Um, and uh, one thing that they can do to pass this bill, even without a single Republican um, vote to beat a filibuster, all that stuff, is they can use a process known as reconciliation, which means if the bill is determined to, um, uh, to have an impact on the debt, on the finances of the country, um, on the deficit, excuse me, on the debt, uh, on the budget, but will not will not uh, increase the federal debt after 10 years, then Democrats can pass it with a simple majority and Republicans won't be able to hold it up. And the, the important takeaway on this, the important thing to keep in mind is that whether or not reconciliation can be used is a determination that's going to be made, I believe it's as soon as tomorrow, by the Senate parliamentarian. In other words, they look at all the data on the bill and they say either yes or no, this bill will be eligible for reconciliation. Here's the important part where Democratic politicians in the Senate need to understand that voters are watching. Democrats can overrule the parliamentarian. That's it, that's the tweet, that's all you need to do. The parliamentarian's word is not law. That's up to the Democrats. Let's move on to a few other things. New York Times reports that France paid McKinsey Consulting millions of dollars to help with getting people vaccinated in France. And as of early January, France had vaccinated several thousand people. Germany, in the meantime, had vaccinated 230,000 people, and Italy had vaccinated 110,000 people. So that's, that's your McKinsey private sector big brain businessman expertise at work, real world, real time, real results. 
Um, another uh, battle shaping up in the Senate is for the Office of Management and Budget. And uh, there is a report in Politico today um, that uh, Susan Collins of Maine, Republican of Maine, has added her name to the list of people who are not going to vote to confirm Neera Tandon as Biden's choice to run the OMB. Why does this matter? Because you need 50 votes to confirm her. And Joe Manchin, again, has already said he's also not going to vote for Tandon. Uh, Collins also, amazingly, say what you will about Neera Tandon, her policies, all of that. Amazingly, Collins is upset about Neera Tandon's tweets. Again, Collins, supporter of President Trump, upset with Neera Tandon's tweets. And again, Tandon's policies aside, this is a woman of color who, uh, while, while uh, other Democratic nominees, with, I would argue, as someone who covered Pete Buttigieg, had a slightly more problematic record, had potentially, you could argue, slightly less qualifications for their jobs, they sailed through. Here's the interesting wrinkle that we might see play out uh, with the Tandon nomination. Politico reports that there's some thinking, who knows how real this is, there's some thinking that at least in part to deny Manchin the role of centrist kingmaker, that Tandon's nomination could be saved, saved by a Mitt Romney or at least a Murkowski, uh, Romney of Utah, Murkowski, Republican of Alaska. And there's, there's some reason to think there's a decent political calculus there. Why let Manchin get all the headlines for tanking a nomination when Romney or Murkowski can get all the headlines for saving it, looking bipartisan in a way that their Republican constituents won't care about. No one who was going to, um, you know, Romney is not going to lose to the Democrats a vote that that would other that, that over over near Tandon over supporting near Tandon, right? One month after near Tandon is confirmed, assuming she's confirmed, no one's going to care. Okay, so there is some some potential for that, and it would be interesting to see if the the fallout of the Trump devastation to the Republican Party is this interesting reshuffling. And and keep in mind, it's it's not weird to have a nomination where the Democrats lose some people on their right flank and the Republicans lose some on their left. We think, we tend to think of uh, Democrats and Republicans as being ideologically separate. That's relatively recent, right? It used to be that you had overlap in the center. You had some Democrats, these are Democrats, you can see because they're wavering. I'm kidding, I love you. You have some Democrats over here, you would have some Democrats over here and you would have some Republicans who were who were more liberal or at least less conservative than some of those Democrats. There used to be more ideological overlap. Maybe we're seeing a return to that. I don't know. Tomorrow, um, the Senate is going to take up the nomination of Javier Becerra to serve as HHS Secretary, Health and Human Services, in the Biden administration. Politico reports, after talking to people close to Becerra, that Becerra is still committed to a position that has been very controversial in the past and has gotten him, has put him to the left of the Democratic Party establishment in the past. Specifically, and my guess is, thanks to Politico, you're going to hear about this tomorrow in the confirmation, Becerra supports allowing undocumented immigrants to be participants in the Affordable Care Act. In other words, to get health insurance. Now, um, uh, and, and also reports that half, half of undocumented immigrants are currently uninsured, which is, of course, a tragic, horrible thing. To be honest, given our Dickensian country, I was amazed that any undocumented immigrants are able to get health insurance. I don't know how you do it, but you folks are amazing generally, so maybe I shouldn't be surprised. There's, there's a real deep-seated feeling of, you're not supposed to be here, so you shouldn't get anything, right? this idea that you shouldn't get a, a driver's license or health insurance or any of those things. And we've come to this infantile state in our culture where those things are seen as privileges as, as for an individual, right? As opposed to things that are part of a system that provides for a better human ecosphere for everyone. 
I have a vested interest in ensuring that the guy in the next lane is qualified to drive, right? That's not, oh, I'm giving him a gift. That's, oh, I'm ensuring that they had to take a test, which means they're now not going to kill me, right? Same logic applies to, to healthcare. You can get all childish and infantile and upset that, oh, my precious portion of ascent went to help someone not die instead of to, to fund military contracts, right? You can get upset about that. But, but the reality is if you don't spend that portion of ascent on their health insurance, you'll end up paying a dollar, right? Because of the consequences of them not having insurance. People without insurance leaving people uninsured leads to worse and more expensive health consequences, not just for the individuals, but for the entire society. And in a pandemic, that shouldn't be hard for people to understand. Uh, the White House yesterday said that um, having teachers be vaccinated is not, not a prerequisite for opening schools. Now, it's this is not up to the federal government, but they are telling schools here are some of the things you can and should do in order to reopen safely. And one of the things they are saying is, no, you do not have to vaccinate every single teacher going into schools. And they're pointing to the CDC guidelines, which say roughly the same thing. And they're saying, look, we're just following the science. And following the science was a, a blatant lie, obviously, under the Trump administration, but it's also a terrible construct generally for thinking about these things. Science doesn't tell you what to do, okay? Science tells you what will happen if you do it. And it doesn't even predict for sure. It can give you rough probabilities, right? Science does not tell you not to drive your car over a cliff. Science tells you that if you drive your car over a cliff and it's a uh, thousand feet high and it weighs five tons with your fat butt in the driver's seat, it can tell you what speed that car will be traveling when it hits the ground. Science does not say do not do that. The decision not to do that is informed by our values. It is not perfectly driven by science. It's informed by our values about the outcomes we want. Do I want to die in a thousand foot fall from a, a cliffside in my car? I do not. My value is that I do not want to die that way, right? That's what drives our decisions. The science tells us which decisions are in line with our values, but let's not pretend that the science is telling us it's okay to send teachers to schools uh, into school buildings without vaccinations. In a not unrelated story, the Washington Post reports today that 271 children, children have died from the coronavirus in the United States in the past, I guess it, we're looking at uh, 12 months now. 271 children. Three quarters of those children were non-white. This is not only disproportionately higher than the population of non-white children, it is also disproportionately higher than the already disproportionate number of non-white adults in the United States who have died from COVID. And this, of course, is on the day that we are marking the fact that one half of one million people in the United States have died from the coronavirus in the past year one half of one million people, higher casualty count than the Civil War. In non-COVID news, uh, Boeing, um, Reuters reports that Boeing has told airlines, hey, uh, some of those 777s that you're flying, you should not do that. Now, why would they tell Boeing to stop flying? Uh, why, would they to, why would Boeing tell airlines to stop flying some of its own airplanes? Well, it's directly connected to the fact that in a flight over Denver, a Boeing 77 began to lose pieces of, its prote of the protective casing on its Pratt & Whitney engine. Pieces of the engine rained down on Denver over the weekend from a Boeing 777. And finally, in Texas, some of these stories about um, astounding, horrific, uh, gouging price 
uh, uh, energy bills that are being hit for people because the free market, the invisible hand in Texas, allowed those utilities that were still providing power to jack up charges. You're literally seeing energy bills in the four and even five figures for people. And what's happening is twofold. One is you're seeing this once I would have said fringe, but now this is a mainstream Republican mindset. Some of them are saying this is good. This is the way it was supposed to work. Uh, and Texans, as you saw Rick Perry saying, the former energy secretary under Trump, former governor of Texas, um, former recipient of a lot of fossil fuel money in campaign donations, he's saying Texans would rather die than submit to federal regulation. This is, of course, the definition of hating America. But the other, the other argument we're seeing here is that something ought to be done about this, right? And this is this tragic, stupid, ahistoric American cycle that we always, always see, which is this. We recognize a problem. We utilize the one, the one, the unum mechanism that we as a society have for solving problems, which is our government. We utilize our government to solve that problem in a way that everyone understands and recognizes and acknowledges is an appropriate use of our collective power. In other words, for instance, to say, no, you may not during an emergency charge people $20,000 for energy. Now, when that, when that went to the, the logical extreme, we had public utilities, right? And, and we still do in some places, but it's a shrinking section of, of how we provide basic needs and resources to people. It used to be that the water company was not a company, right? It was the water department and your government provided it to you. And what happens is, here's the American cycle I was talking about, is that rich people or want to be rich people see money there. And so they pay someone to come up with a narrative for why the government shouldn't be doing it and then why the government shouldn't be telling them how to do it, and then why the government shouldn't be involved at all. And th the upshot isn't uh, five-figure energy bills. History tells us what the upshot is. The upshot is feudalism, right? The upshot is slavery. The upshot is company towns. We know that when the individuals who are prone to or inclined to resent any outside interference in their, in their drive to extract everything they can from anyone they can, these individuals will not stop. They will be like children, right? You need to establish boundaries or they will keep going. They will keep looking for boundaries. And that's the cycle. They find a boundary. When public outrage becomes so great that people finally become informed enough about the issue to say, oh, we can stop this with regulation or, or uh, um, nationalization. Let's do that, right? And the reason it's a cycle is because we forget in the meantime. We forget. We forget our history. We forget what reality has shown us. We forget human nature. We forget the real narratives of this country. And so we fall for the BS narratives that say, gosh, we should have a businessman be president. All right, that's all I got today. So like I said, um, that's uh, that's my look at what I think is is uh, bouncing around in the news today that's important, things that are coming up. If, uh, if you found this useful, I hope you'll share it, let people know to check in, and I'll do some of these um, on a periodic basis. Uh, try to aim for nine in the morning, and if anyone's around and interested and the numbers um, justify it, I'll keep doing it and try to make it a regular thing. Um, in the meantime, I hope you'll subscribe to TYT Investigates. Check out our stories at tyt.com slash investigates. And now I'm going to take a look at the chat and maybe answer a few questions and say hello. Uh, hi, guys. What do we have here? Um, Lemon Lime says, oh, my God, I actually got the notification on time to catch it live. Hello again, Lemon Lime. Um, Carrie Firefly says, Larson. Correct. Jess says, well, well, well. Hello, Jonathan. I feel like there's a noir film opening in there. 
Uh, Rolf Roller Dragon says, Jonathan, great to see you. Most people are not making it. 2,000, 1,400. This is referring to the amount of direct relief in the in the COVID relief bill. Roller Dragon says, it is not enough. Each day we don't see survival checks. It should increase 300. Um, Tyler Hackner says, one thing Republicans and us can agree on is near attendance is terrible. Um, I would I would make a differentiation there, which is that I think, uh, first of all, not everyone decides that people are terrible. I try to avoid the the categorization, the essentialist categorization of entire individuals. Um, and so, if you are not looking at Neera Tandon and judging her as an individual human, and you break out what are the actions or the speech or the rhetoric from Neera Tandon with which you have a problem. My guess is that Republicans and Democrats actually are not on the same page about the problems they have with Neera Tandon. Um, uh, Toto now says, I'm kidding, I love you, but I didn't, I didn't see the, action, the, the first insult. So, uh, I, but I, I'll take the I love you, thank you. Uh, Tyler Hackner says, completely horrible what we're doing to immigrants. T Tyler Hackner says, everyone deserves human dignity. Lemon Lime says, I'm shocked they have health care at all. DLJ says, tisk tisk. Here he goes again with his collectivist commonwealth thinking. Don't you know that these people just have bad souls? As not only a, an atheist, but a materialist in the philosophical sense, I don't believe in souls, and I find it an unhelpful way of evaluating human behavior. Um, and the other thing I would say is that um, good souls in bad environments with, with poorly structured incentives and et cetera, et cetera, can end up making bad decisions, doing making mistakes. Marco Antonio uh, says, Jonathan is 100% correct about science and values, good content right there. Thanks so much, Marco. Um, Nick Hill says, hello from South Bend, Indiana. Uh, hello, South Bend, Indiana. Haven't been, haven't been there for a while, um, but uh, I'm, I, 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 still, I still carry you in my heart, South Bend, Indiana. So thanks for saying hello, Nick. Um, really cool says, hey, is Larson live streaming in the morning again? Good. <laughs> uh, well, like I said, thank you for that. Thank you for the kind, kind words, really cool. Um, and like I said, if you want to see more, if the numbers bear it out and justify me doing it uh, at this time, I used to do it later in the morning, then uh, please share this. Let people know to, to tune in and uh, I'll try to make a habit of it. Jesse says, I saw this guy on the news. He got a bill for over $16,000. The energy company took it, to, took it out directly from his bank account. That's the invisible hand, right? That's the free market at work. You set up your bank account, and then to make things easy and convenient for you, you let everyone in the world have direct access to your bank account. You sign away the fine print, and pretty soon, they're all trading your money. Really cool says, yeah, fossil fuel execs shamelessly cheering their windfall dollars. Kathleen Cloud says, have a good day. See you tonight. I don't know what that's about. Maybe I shouldn't have read that. Uh, Larry Grant says, could you tell me what Biden is waiting for to pass the COVID-19 relief bill? I can, Larry. He is waiting for it to be sent to the White House, right? The president can't just say, can't just pick up a paper and say, aha, this is a law because I'm going to sign it. It has to be passed by the House and it has to be passed by the Senate. The exact same version, Right. Once the House and Senate do that and send it to Biden, then he can sign it. Now, of course, the, the reality of politics is he can press Democrats and potentially even some Republicans to make things move faster. Jason R. says Nazi Germany is proof that a whole lot of people with good souls can do a whole lot of evil. Little Tickle says, hello from California. It pains me to see what is happening. You are not peasants. Big business is not your laird. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to say thanks so much for tuning in. And like I said, please subscribe. Please share this. Like it and uh, tell other folks who might enjoy it. Uh, a little a quick uh, shot of headlines in the morning 
uh, to come check us out. And if enough people do, then I'll try to keep doing it. And maybe we'll get to a place where we're doing it every morning. All right. Take care. Take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. Bye.